Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And every Wednesday, hour three, we have Professor James okay. McCanny. He's actually going to be on a part four mainly, but in every part of the six-part series, uh, the uh, Countdown to Apocalypse series on National Geographic History Channel 2. And the uh, History Channel 2 is uh, doing a major special this Friday evening, uh, The especially the last 15 minutes, they'll be doing a major input onto the issue of Planet X and the uh, effects of that. Professor McKinney, uh I've been watching this series. It's very well done. It deals with some real issues, such as the attempts by scientists like Dr. Mishu Kaku, who actually has talked to the uh, government and warned them with 40,000 scientists that have told the government that they have to harden the grid against coronal mass ejections, which are likely to be very significant in the next few years. We uh, don't really deal with the idea of space weather or near-Earth objects to an adequate extent, uh, either nationally or internationally. And you're the primary scientist that actually has brought us in a sense, the perspective of the plasma universe. Uh, give us a kind of a, a foretaste of what you're going to talk about this coming Friday on History Channel 2 on uh, this whole issue of the countdown to apocalypse. Not like it's going to happen on a specific date, but we need to be aware that, that space weather and near-Earth objects and plasma discharges across space, long-distance gravitonic waves from a passing object, whether it's a dwarf star, red or brown dwarf, or a large planetary-like object, can have catastrophic effects on the Earth that we're not really prepared to deal with. Yeah, the whole concept is action at a distance in which uh, the, a big object comes by Earth, gravitational waves get set up in the surface of the Earth and uh, causes uh, basically the shifting of the crust and mantle of the Earth over the inner core and uh, that's causing a physical pole shift. In other words, what we what used to be the pole and the pole ice, etc., is now shifted, and that starts a, a evacuation of that water to ice turning into water, and that also causes a uh, uh, the, not only the flooding uh, but uh, the uh, mountain building other effects that go with it. Yeah, in other words, you're not talking just about a, you're not just talking about a magnetic shift. Uh, for example, I, I read some reports that, that go back that uh, Alaska, I think it's something like, uh, was it 8 million years ago, was actually on the equator. Uh, yeah. And, that, that, and then, in other words, the areas where we think the poles are, for example, there's maps that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, the Portuguese map maker that made, uh, his name is Amerigo Vespasi, uh, that's what they call it. Some people say that's why they called it America, but it wasn't true. Uh, actually, had maps that he had access to back at the time when he made the maps of North America that showed uh, clearly the continent of Antarctica. Antarctica did not was not a uh, uh, it was a continent that was inhabited by people uh, as long as so many thousand years ago. So the fact is, where we think the continents exist and where these islands exist, like Baffin Island, where there were giant trees like the redwoods of California. Uh, I've talked to uh, people from Red Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and from the Bedford Institute in Halifax that have been up to Baffin Island. They've pulled out the tusks of woolly mammoths 26 feet long and seen trees with circumferences that are 4 and 5 feet across that are 180 to 200 feet high. Petrified, uh, some of these woolly mammoths with food frozen in their mouths like they were dropped into liquid nitrogen from a collapse of the upper thermosphere. 200 degrees below zero. So uh, the Earth is a violent place, and people aren't prepared for violent, catastrophic changes occurring in our time, are they? No, not at all. Nothing like this. As, you know, people cannot even imagine. We talk about, a, for example, a 10 on the Richter scale as an earthquake, and, uh, you know, so let's take it up to 25, something like that. Right. And uh, one of the things you're talking about is the disjunction between the lithosphere, which is the crust of the Earth, anywhere between 8 and 40 miles, and it's very thin over places like the hot spots over the Hawaiian Islands, separating from the mantle and slipping, and it doesn't have to slip fast. It can slip at 1.3 or 1.4 miles per hour over a couple of months, and it's moved 1,200 or 1,400 miles. It doesn't mean a total full pole flip, like the Earth flip on its side, but it does mean, and there's geological evidence, that there's been a lithospheric slip that is part of the mountain building and the continent formation of parts of the planet. I mean, it's just part of geology, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, uh, the modern uh, science as we see it today has a lot of, I, I call them band-aid theories, 
the whole idea that, uh, you know, uh, plate tectonics, that these mountains move slowly. Uh, no, the, they move the, very the, catastrophically yeah. fast. In fact, yeah. where I got my That's source right. was actually U.S. Space Command that told me <laughs> their favorite place for building underground cities is dormant magma domes of a mile and a half to four to six miles below ground, anywhere between four and 12 cubic miles in size. And where the hot spots moved from the, uh, the mantle of the Earth, and there's no longer service, so they become basically serviceable empty magma domes. So these are uh -huh. present for millions of years from the Earth's lithosphere, periodically through catastrophic slips of the lithosphere, like I call, it the, I call it the peach theory. If you take a Georgia peach and you heat it or steam it, the skin will slide right around on the body, and it looks like it's a full healthy peach, but the skin of the peach, which is like the crust of the Earth, will slide on the mantle or the body of the peach. And that happens all the time. It's a periodic thing that happens that it stabilizes again. You've got new hot spots, new volcanic you know, that emerge, new uh, volcanic mountain ranges under the oceans or the land occur. And that's one of the things that actually forms our planet. It's a primary pro force that actually makes our planet is periodically catastrophic lithospheric slip. Exactly. Uh, I did a show uh, last summer, possibly in June, and uh, I went and paid a visit out to Utah, some of the big canyon areas up on the southwestern part of the Colorado Plateau. Uh, in Bryce Canyon is a uh, place where, uh, if you look at it, it just sank into the ground. So uh, basically what happened is one of those magnum holes down there. Yeah, giant magnum, right? Yeah. There was just enough shaking going on where the whole area just dropped down up as much as 9,000 feet in some places. Yeah. Uh, and so those, those it, you know, there was a lot of shaking. That dome had existed for a long time. And you just see where this whole area just dropped down and you see the, the stratified layers in the ground and the and these spires, et cetera, down in the canyon floor, and they match with what's up above at the uh, walls of the canyon. So you just see that this whole area dropped down, and then you read the explanation on the, the uh, government-provided uh, billboards there, and it said, oh, this over millions of years moved, and... Uh, how about uh, millions you know, of seconds? Up and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about millions of seconds over two months? See, what I suspect exactly. will happen is that whenever this is, and I'm not setting a date, that whatever gravitonic effects happen to cause a lithospheric slip, it's probably due to happen now because we're passing through the galactic plane, which happens every 62 million years. We are now at the 26,000 year cycle, which every half of that, 13,000 years, we had a, a catastrophic lithospheric slip. There's good evidence for it. There's also a magnetic slip that happens that they found with the zebra stripes on the bottom of the ocean with magnetometers. They discovered after World War II when they're looking for U-boats, they realized, like, oh, my gosh, look at all these magnetic sh uh, changes that occur. Not every 700,000 years, but the magnetic changes occur relatively frequently. Yeah, and they're not, it's, there are some that might follow a pattern. But then there's some that, uh, are, that don't exactly follow a pattern. So the question exactly. is, uh, how, how often do these things occur? And uh, one thing I would say to state it is that um, the recurring uh, planetary passages are not on some kind of a time scale. Because exactly. Let's, say yeah. that, let, let's just take an example. Say that there was this object that came in every 10,000 years, like clockwork, a great big comet, right. a great big nucleus. Earth would be in a different place each passage, so there's no guarantee that it's always going to come right next to Earth. Yeah, so in other words, it would, it would actually pull the Earth into a different uh, orbit around the Sun as well. It would have an effect on that too, right? If it came close, but there's no guarantee that it's even going to come close. To yeah. So Earth these other so so in other words, these other events you're talking about that are happening every so many say ten or eleven or thirteen thousand years are separate from the idea of the passage of a dwarf star or a planet X. Well, yeah, there, there, there are many of them. That's the issue. Ah, in other words, we're not just dealing with one large object. We're dealing with a whole range of objects that could affect us. Wow. Right. Let's get into this when we come back. With Professor James McKenney, JMCCSCI dot com is the website. <laughs> 
Welcome back, and uh, Professor McKinney, so uh, give us some insights as to the, the planet X issue. And it's not just one planet. You mentioned a number of objects. Uh, what we know is that red dwarf stars, for example, have very powerful magnetic fields, sometimes as much as 20, 30, 100 times stronger than even the sun, even though they're a tiny fraction of the mass of the sun. We have brown dwarf stars, we have planetary sized objects, and we have large comets. I know Velikovsky's theory, which I think you ascribe to, that was a good friend of uh, Einstein, and, and I believe Einstein believed this as well, is that Venus was in fact a captured, in effect, super comet that actually has reverse, uh, uh, if you want to call it a reverse spin to all the other planets, and indicates it's a quote, much younger planet than any of the other planets because of its origins. Uh, can you talk about this quote, Planet X? Uh, theory and why it's not just the Mayans and, and Hopi and etc. People in general know that something cataclysmic is about to happen, whether it's a CME or the passage of a nearest object. There are things that are going to happen in the next number of years that are going to be extinction level events and civilization. The global elite are preparing for it by building underground cities and the public are being kept in the dark or being subjugated to dialectics to get total control of the population through RFID chips and uh, manufactured crises so that the population will not interfere with the survival of the bifurcated civilization where the technically advanced super elite survive and there's a continuity of government and civilization through this uh, mechanism. Uh, yeah, exactly. And the, the Venus event uh, is what I call the Venus event. Venus was a large comet captured by Jupiter it uh, eventually became the planet Venus. This is Quetzalcoatl of the Mayas, uh, in, uh, who's uh, ruled the night sky, the Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent god of the night sky, whose heart became the planet Venus. And uh, this was a planet X type event. Uh, so what I keep telling people is that there is not just one planet X out there. There are many, many. Yeah, these are rogue planets, and in fact, a number of rogue planets being discovered by advanced uh, uh, research to discover various planet-sized objects that are maybe Earth-like or non-Earth-like is discovering a lot of rogue planets and a lot of rogue uh, comets that are very large, especially not only in the Oort cloud but in in the, in the interstellar space. That uh, just like rogue stars, there's literally stars that drift around the galaxy as well. Yeah, exactly, and that. Uh, NASA has announced 40 new planets, and the whole reason Pluto had to be minimized as a planet is because they already had 40, and this was many years ago when Pluto was uh, uh, reduced from a planet to a, uh, a Pluto-type minor planet, they call it. Or you're you're talking like about that. 40 large objects in just the Oort cloud, let alone in deeper space. Well, not, the Oort cloud is way out. I don't even believe in the Oort cloud, but it's yeah. a hypothetical area where comets supposedly form because they didn't, they don't have any other explanation. But uh, right. the Oort cloud is something that cannot possibly be detected. But the the point is that the uh, these forty objects are just in the area beyond Pluto, two three Pluto distances from the sun, and there's forty new planets out there. So if they said we got forty new planets, everybody on on Earth would say, well, w wait a minute, I thought there were nine. Now yeah, 49. right. And some of these are fairly large. They're, they're gas giants or whatever. They're not little tiny planets. Either. They're pretty big as well. Isn't there one called, yeah, so, uh, there's Sedna, and there's a, one that I think that they're referring to as a gas giant out there as well. Yeah, and so the, the question is, um, could these come in, and some of them be on orbits that could come into the solar system and cause damage? And, of course, everybody on the planet, would bring that would bring up the question. So instead of having that happen, they denounced Pluto for being a planet, so they didn't have to announce that all of a sudden we got 40 new planets. Uh, and, you know, it was damage control. Uh, well, the Voyager pro space probe, and I found this out from my classified sources, was uh, because they were concerned about this very same issue, and they were trying to find out if the perturbations that were looked at by Tycho Brahe going over a century ago, the, uh, the uh, astronomer, uh, and it was due to the perturbations of Neptune were actually caused by these large massive objects in deep space, uh, so the fact is they've discovered it. And, in fact, it came out in uh, the early 80s that they've discovered, NASA has discovered, uh, quote, a planet X, which really isn't necessarily a planet. It could be a, a comet. It can be a, a small red or, or, or brown dwarf star. And they know these objects are actually quite a bit more frequent than their presence. So one of the first things they told me at Space Command uh, in Colorado Springs, uh, Shriver Air Force Base, is that uh, there's tons of these out there. 
And then they, in fact, they, they can't track them all. There's so many, they have supercomputers trying to keep track of them. Some of them are zipping along at, at such high velocities, they have to move satellites out of the way so they don't get impacted near space. Or they get completely blindsided by them because they whip by at 60,000 miles above the Earth uh, at, you know, 35 to 50,000 miles an hour, and they don't even know they're on their way until they yeah, start to they, show they, up, uh, they burn up with the sun or, or, or other things, show an interaction that they can identify them. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of matter, let's put it that way, floating around out there and, and whipping by Earth. So it's a dangerous place. It's not a it's not a nice environment out in outer space. We're kind of we've had a good run here of, of many thousands of years, but uh, that could end any day. And one it's interesting on this History Channel special. Uh, we're talking about will air Friday night. They have me repeating over and over that these things can come in very fast, meaning that we're not going to have a warning. No. No, in fact, if there is a warning, the warning will be a half an hour or so for the global elite to get to their underground shelters and the rest of the population will be left to survive the cataclysm. And, and of course, if you look at the phases, the first phase is you have a massive uh, uh, impact wave if it hits the ocean, you're going to have two effects. You're going to release magma from the deep ocean, and you're going to have a tsunami, and you're going to have a compression wave that causes a firestorm. If it hits land, it immediately causes a firestorm and a massive debris cloud, which will block out the sun, so all the crops will die, and a lot of people nearby will be suffocated by dust. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, the problem then is you get the effect like a nuclear winter. You, you immediately plunge the earth into darkness, so you, the temperatures drop like a rock, and everything freezes. So uh, I don't think people are prepared for this. They don't think that this could happen. Uh, we have a couple of objects you're watching closely. One is this uh, uh, comet that's going to pass by 25 kilometers in size at least, or larger, pass by the Earth in January. And then further out, it, the tail is going to go through Mars around October 4th, I think you said, around that date in that window. Um, yeah. But that's just one that we've identified that everybody knows about. There's also 2012 DA-14 that's going to pass on my birthday, February 15th. It's 197 kilometers across, which is pretty dang big. That's about uh, 750 feet, big enough to take out, say, Luxembourg uh, if it struck the Earth. And they, they stopped releasing the data in May because they kept recalculating it and calibrating it closer and closer to the Earth. So the last data in May indicated it went from 100,000 uh, kilometers above the Earth to less than 5,000. That's not good, that there's, they blocked the data, and they've now called it classified. So all near-Earth object data is now classified so the public and or Tier 2 scientists can't get access. Uh, yeah, this, I, I found out something interesting this week. Um, there is a, uh, uh, some very interesting, I, I would say it's damage control being done by NASA about the Comet uh, C-2012-S1. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, a big one, uh, yeah, tell yeah, what's going on there. Well, it's interesting because I don't get to see everything on the Internet. But uh, what happens is uh, so one of the people that listens to my regular show was saying that the... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this thing has been kind of a noisy area moving out of here. But, Keep uh, that thought. And we'll be right back and we'll complete that thought. Uh, we want to hear the whole story with Professor James McCanny in just a moment. Welcome back, and uh, Professor McKinney, let's continue your thought just before the break. Uh, th this is important to people grasp that uh, although these things are remote, they're not unlikely. Uh, it's very likely that in the next two years we're going to have a major coronal mass ejection that's going to knock out the power grid somewhere in the northern hemisphere. It's very likely that we're going to have changes of Earth volcanism, which is primarily melting the permafrost and the uh, areas of the polar ice cap in the North Pole, although the North South Pole is increasing very dramatically its polar ice. Uh, in the Ross Ice Field and so on, there's major Earth changes occurring to the to the uh, under oceanic currents, such as the loss of the uh, loop current from the Gulf of Mexico from the Bacondo drilling, and everywhere we're seeing sinkholes. So the Earth is starting to go through what I call planetary convulsions, and the population is not being prepared by government. The government are basically trying to song and dance like the Pied Piper with Obama and all the globalists, while they prepare underground cities and basically tell the public. Well, we're going to give you tier two science. We'll give you a little fairy tales, and we'll try to marginalize the people that ask questions about, you know, Planet X or 2012 and beyond. 
And I think that a lot of the time they want to spin 2012 as a big joke. Don't ever listen to those conspiracy theorists that believe that 2012 or thereafter could cause a cataclysmic effect to the planet. And so people will go back to sleep and stop preparing. It's really uh, very very disturbing. Uh, exactly. I, I was just before the break, I was starting to talk about some damage control that's going on at NASA. Yeah, tell us about that. Because this, about this comet uh, 2012 S1, right? Yeah, yeah. And this came from a listener. Um, uh, apparently, there's a, w- a website, and the uh, uh, NASA has some some I, I would call them disinformation agents. Oh, you kidding? Monitor, uh, who, yeah, who <laughs> yeah. monitor this, yeah. and it's about C2012 S1. Right. Uh, um, many years ago, uh, about 2005, there was a website started, and it's very interesting. It was a website that claimed to be uh, proponents of the electric universe, and of course that's a term I coined in the late 1970s in a paper that I wrote. Right, but so you're the, you're the originator of the original theory about the electric universe and the plasma universe. Yeah. You're the guy. Yeah, and, we know that. And so, anyway, what happened is these people, there's one guy that claims to be a plasma physicist, Ph.D., and he's got no degree at all. Right. And, and anyway, the point is that this website was started in 2005, right. and every day, every day they get a picture from NASA. and supposed, They're supposed to be fighting with NASA and for right, you know, about the electric universe and stuff. But anyway, what they were set up to do is to create a crazy, just like crazy lady talks to alien planet X topic. Right. They were set up to be the the people that astronomers can point to when they talk about electric universe. And so, of course, when but the listener that listens to my show regularly put my name up there on the uh, blog, they immediately pulled it down. So here's the, it's a little dog and pony show that they've set up between the imitation, the imposters, and the NASA scientists. And they have this continual dialogue that doesn't make any sense, and the NASA scientists can laugh at this and, you know, and, and, but they won't allow my name to be mentioned. Which well, is it's like because you'd, ra- you'd raise scientifically based questions, you'd ask uh, accurate information that would be require a scientific response and, and an academic response, and they don't want to do that. They also don't want to disclose no. information they're hiding from you and other tier two scientists, because even well informed public, if you ask the right questions, you realize our governments are lying to us. They're preparing themselves, just like the movie 2012, even though it wasn't the right scenario. They're preparing themselves for cataclysm events, but they don't want to tell the public at all. They're basically yeah. It's not just in America. It's in Norway where there's uh, at least two cities are 11.4 uh, cubic miles in size. It's cities all over China, Russia. They have two giant cities under uh, their, 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 they call it the Evil Mountain in, in Russia, where they each, each one of those cities can house a quarter million people. Uh, it's everywhere. And the problem is people think, we're just making this up. I've actually physically been in the underground cities. I know they exist. I've been there. Yeah, what I think is comical about this whole dog and pony show is that they are downplaying uh, C-2012-S1. Right. And all, all of the websites that once were jumping up and down about Comet Elenin are all quiet as a church mouse now. You would think right. they would be all over this comet, and they're not. And so the, the point is that um, they... Uh, they do not want to talk about this comet. They don't want it in the public well, eye at all. Do they connect it with the, so, with the Hopi issue about the blue kachina? Because I would think that the plasma effects in your research on uh, would fit uh, perfectly with the Hopi prophecy about the blue kachina. Uh, any, any connection there? Uh, none that I have other than uh, we're still trying to sort that out, what the blue kachina, the red kachina, etc., but it's, it's uh, NASA is very much doing damage control about this comet. Right, which the means it's that, like anything. If they're hiding something, then you know there's something to be hidden. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're doing a lot of damage control on this comet. So that was the, the point of bringing this up. Right. And like I say, they won't mention my name. And the listener actually posted my name and a link to my web page, and they immediately took it down. And so, right. Now, you if know, they disclose like, all the data to you and to other Tier 2 scientists or advanced, then you'd simply interpret it and say, hey, this is what's really going on, and it doesn't affect national security. It does affect planetary security, 
And the problem is we need a consortium of scientists from all countries that have advanced space programs, including Russia, China, uh, Argentina, Brazil, etc., so that we can deal with this issue rather than trying to pretend it doesn't exist because the population are being left hanging out here with the plan by the globalists to actually sequester as little as 20 million people in America and the total population they want to save underground is half a million. Half a billion. And that's a fact. I mean, I know this from talking to Dr. Isley, the Ph.D. physicist from the uh, World Constitution Parliament Association. He actually gave me the Federation of Earth documents with 157 nations at that time back in the mid late 90s, 97. He spent an entire evening with me explaining how they're going to geoengineer the planet and put upper uh, space uh, nanoparticles that are basically paramagnetic barium, thorium, and aluminum so they can create a plasma sphere to stop coronal mass ejections. It wasn't to change the albedo of the Earth and to uh, act as a radiomagnetic uh, mirror for imaging through the Earth's all the resources, and also to use it as a scalar weapon for plasma interferometry. So the fact is globalists are doing things without any consent of the people. They're not informing us about anything, and they're keeping Tier 1 science away from Tier 2 scientists and the public, and I consider it a form of science crime against the population of Earth. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the other thing that was interesting about the damage control on this uh, C-2012-S1 is that the same guy who was uh, the defender of NASA, so to speak, for all the Comet Ellen and stuff that went right. on, he's the same guy now on this Comet, and I didn't realize it, but the same uh, observatory discovered both Ellen and this one, and I find that a little interesting because with all of the telescopes around the world and amateurs, one would think that, gee, somebody else might discover one of these comets one of these days. But uh, it just seems well, like a little too much coincidence going on here. Yeah, the thing is also we're not getting data from the Chandra X-ray telescope, from the stereo telescopes uh, in space, right. from SOHO. We're not getting anything from the one launched three years ago made in Germany, the telescope at 40,000 feet in the Boeing aircraft, the infrared telescope, because most of these objects require X-ray or infrared telescopy in order to identify them, or the Arecibo radio telescope in Argentina run by the Vatican. Nobody's releasing any data. It's like the mafia. Nobody knows nothing. Yeah, <laughs> that's about it. It's really... Uh, Nobody yeah. knows nothing. It's like you got in New Jersey, only these are astronomers and physicists. And to me, this is a grave crime. Now, one of the scientists came out in the... Uh, in Brazil, a senior scientist for their uh, satellite, uh, for their for their telescope systems, one of the senior astronomers came out and said he's identified, uh, quote, this planet as an extra object and has apparently data indicating that it is coming in, is approaching from the ecliptic at a very highly uh, angle, and it can be seen from Antarctica and from their uh, southern Brazilian telescopes. So, uh, have you heard anything about that? Uh, no. No, I have not. Yeah, it was a, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. It says uh, unusual, like Arago or something like that. And I have it posted up a few months ago. But he's come out and actually made a statement publicly. I'm sure he, they've tried to defrock him, but apparently he's one of their top astronomers. So he probably feels he's close enough to retirement and high enough in the uh, chain of command that his conscience has superseded his desire to maintain his position of power. Uh, well, yeah, there, there are very few people like that that will risk their future. Exactly. Welcome back, and uh, Professor McCanny, tell us uh, about your uh, video coming up this uh, f uh, Friday and your books and videos. You have a number of amazing books and videos that are available at your website, JMCC. ISCI.com, JMCCSCI.com. Uh, tell us all about it and uh, summarize what you're saying now in terms of where we're at and what kinds of questions we need to ask because I know the government agencies are listening. I know they need to start kind of getting real uh, and stop trying to sell out. Like I know congressmen and senators who've been told they have underground places in this underground city, which is why they're shutting up and not hardening the grid, just like uh, uh, Senator. Um, uh, from Alaska, the you know the Rhino senator decided uh, Lisa Murkowski to block the hardening of the grid three and a half years ago. Uh, when the when the Obama administration first addressed this issue, we have Mishu Kaku, we have yourself, we have many other scientists coming out and saying we need to harden the grid. We've had some major CMEs. Nothing is happening. This is pure insanity. The cost uh, would be a couple hundred million dollars 
to harden the grid just in the United States, and the cost, according to the General Accounting Office, is between three and five trillion dollars if the power grid goes down as little as three months uh, in America. Oh yeah, that would be catastrophic. But the uh, uh, I, you were mentioning, I should mention that where my books are available. Yes. Uh, JMCCSCI.com is the website. Um, and uh, this Friday evening, History Channel 2, I'll uh, be on uh, featured on there talking about Planet X issues. And uh, given that, you know, the, I, did, I was a, a member of a, of a team, so to speak, of people being interviewed, I did three and a half hours of interview in about 15 minutes possibly total for all six shows was actually getting aired, so there was a lot of editing done. And yeah, so, yeah. But it'll, it's, a, it's a good way for people to then start accessing my information and, and get the view of the broader picture. Yeah, they but, need to get your uh, books, though. They need to listen to your radio show, and, of course, every Wednesday now, uh, you'll be on the... the, the uh, uh, Nutra Medical Report Clay and Iron Show because we're going to not cut any uh, slack here. We're going to ask tough questions and we're demanding. In fact, I think we need to file a freedom of information lawsuit against the government because they refuse to release this information. I just recently heard from uh, Stan Dale that he's got an alternative source for information to do predictive uh, issues on earthquakes because they cut it off three years ago. Uh, it's, it's an example of what I call a crime against the public to cut off access to information that allows rational and intelligent people to make good decisions and push the science forward for the public. Because to me, democratization of access to information and ability to rationally analyze it is is the most basic part of our freedom. Cutting off information is a form of a violation of our, our civil rights. Uh, absolutely. And what I always point out is 99.9% .9 of all scientists are employed by the government, and so, you know, the, the option of running a McDonald's hamburger stand or shutting up and keep, keeping your tenure and retirement, well, uh, you know, that's, that's a kind of a, what would you say, an easy choice or uh, not, too, yeah. not, not too many options there. For the guy that's got a PhD. Yeah, it's like the, the Sicilian Mafia option. Uh, you can you yeah. can either uh, shut up or you'll live with, sleep with the fishes. Yeah, exactly. So that's what's <laughs> going on. But I don't deal with that. I've never dealt with it. And that's why uh, I do my own research. And uh, anyway, Well, you're I'm so visible now, here. too, that uh, they just don't want to even have you on their website blogs because they know if you raise good questions, they can't kind of eliminate you now. It's just the same as myself. We're so public that we know that there's a number of people even inside the Special Forces and Delta and, and uh, uh, other agencies that won't go over that little red line, that they're, the globalists are terrified that they, they can't neutralize people like you and me. Because uh, they know that there are people inside their own agencies that are not going to go along with this program if they hear the whole truth. You know, I think they also learn a lot from us. Uh, right. And I know that's true. And, uh, oh, sure they do. They don't have the whole perspective of the forest and the trees. They, they don't see right. the, the consequences. They might be told as a congressman, you just had a meeting with your NSA agent. If you shut up and don't do anything about hardening the grid, you and your family will have a place in the underground city. We'll bring you to Mount Weather or wherever it is, and you'll be safe, and we'll sequester them through the catastrophe. Don't worry, you got a place. And they may find out, sorry, no place for you today. Yeah, they're going to go knock on the door, and the door is going to be locked. And, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, it, anyway. yeah, and by the way, I've also heard in my sources that the reason why they've been sequestering this DNA uh, in uh, Central Australia for the last, for all the Western nations for the last 40-plus years is because they've already picked to abduct people that will actually be taken in underground cities as seed stock for a new civilization. People say that's not possible. I said, of course it is. That's why they're sequestering this DNA and they've kept it for decades. They've even pe people suing to actually get it removed from the database because when they've ru already ruled out phenylketonuria and other genetic uh, diseases from urine and other testing of the, of the heel prick of newborns, they know damn well why they're keeping the data so they can do genetic analysis. And I visited Affymetrix in Chicago and uh, Building 10 at the Oak Ridge National Labs, and they have a DNA biochip. They can analyze your DNA from any other individual on Earth in less than 42 cents back in 1999 when I visited there uh, and do an analysis in less than five minutes with a laptop and this DNA biochips with DNA endonucleases. So people say, Dr. Deagle, you can't give us technical details. I say, you're talking to the wrong dude. I'll give you exquisite detail of exactly how they do it. Uh, yeah, this we're heading into uncharted uh, waters here. So, um, anyway, yeah, Dr. Bill, 
thank you. And um, I'm, and, I'm in a and, situation where I got a. Uh, that that's good. Well, we're we're gonna uh, continue with a little dialogue here for a minute. I'm gonna ask some questions from Santi, our uh, uh, guest here in the studio, and see what he thinks about all of this. And uh, also out there in the public, if you have questions, call in quickly. We have a few minutes before uh, airtime. We have maybe one uh, caller can call in eight hundred two five nine five seven nine one. Uh, thank you, Doctor Professor uh, Jay McC- James McCassie, uh, McCady, and it's really important people ask the right questions. I tell people you don't have to believe anything we say, but ask better questions. Uh, Sante, your questions about what you see happening uh, on the show today. Well, I, uh, as always, I'm always uh, learn something new, and uh, I've been a prepper for about six years, so. Yeah, you're a prepper's prepper. I, I like the, my, my favorite show on television is Doomsday Preppers, but sometimes these people are over the top. They latch onto one thing, you know, right. like the avian flu or some issue, and they don't realize there's a whole range of things that can happen, and they have to have layers. You know, does the power go up for four hours? Uh, do the bank shut down for five days? Do, you know, does do you get a CME that knocks out the power in just one region of the United States? Uh, there's layers, and you need to be prepared for all those layers, but people kind of go off on a tangent, or or they actually become their own worst enemy. They actually can create a situation where they can hurt themselves, as I saw in the latest Doomsday Prepper show. It was scary and humorous at the same time. They did raise some good issues, but there are people that, to be honest with you, they need prepper, proper prepper consult, consultations before they start going off on their own to do things. Yeah, and it's it, everything's a little bit different, you know. Uh, some people think it's going to be an avian flu. Some people it's going to be the sun or the uh, planted X or something. I, I else. can give you my percentages That's if right. I was going to rate rate them. I'd say the chances of a swine avian flu uh, pandemic in the next five years are about eighty percent. I'd say the chances of a CMA striking somewhere in the northern hemisphere in the next two years are virtually ninety percent. I'd say a bank holiday. Uh, is likely, but it'd be very short, four or five days. And, it, and although they'll tell you it's going to be catastrophic, is to bring in policies to cut off uh, benefits mm-hmm. or entitlements and to raise taxes. Mm-hmm. Because both sides, Party A and Party B of the snake party, called the Republic <laughs> crap and the Democrat, but either way, you're going to get crap, party. And the same with the globalists. They're going to continue lying to us and manipulating us to the latest actors in the Actors Guild called presidents and congressmen and senators that won't do the right thing. They're going to do the thing that the powers that be want to run them. Um, I'd say that it's very likely we're going to be facing uh, a uh, limited nuclear war sometime in the next 10 years in the Middle East. Uh, that nuclear war will eventually uh, be cut short by catastrophic global and, and, uh, and uh, solar and, and uh, galactic events, which will cut those days short, as it says in the Bible, because it was left up to mankind. Mankind would end mankind, and only the global elite and underground cities would survive. Uh, I think they want to manage the chaos because they want to go through a ceremony that they've started called Pahanuk, the ancient ceremony of the Phoenix, which has started in Sumer and before in Atlantis and Mu, where they want to destroy civilization, but they want to be the masters of destruction so they can control what comes after. They maintain the knowledge, which is kept in the ancient labyrinth in Egypt. They want to maintain the seed stock of the population, and they want to control the global elite as, as to who gets what and what scientists and high priests in the new culture and the new civilization rise. Mm. So if people are aware of these things and ask better questions, they realize you may listen to Coast to Coast, you may listen to many other shows, you're never going to hear anything as straight up is on this program, the Neutral Medical Report, Clay and Iron Show. I agree with that. That is true. It's the only one that's got answers instead of just problems. Yeah, and we're not just going to put you into confusion. We want you to ask better questions. Just do your own research and start prepping, even if it's only getting three weeks of water and food, even if it's only taking a uh, concealed carry permit, learning how to defend yourself. Uh, you got to start with basic things so that at the very least level, you're ready to deal with two weeks of power and no food or groceries and you can't go outside your house. <laughs> Back tomorrow with Dr. Mike Kaufman, amazing update. You don't want to miss it. And Tim Alexander, our geopolitical historical analyst, what's going on, and nuclear expert Chris.